PCCI is the largest business organization in the Philippines. It's on price of local chambers, which number to about 110. And direct members and industry associations and business councils, which represent 17 regions of the Philippines. 23% of PCCI members uh, is comprised of large firm, while the remaining 77% are in the micro, small, and medium enterprises. Front and center of our advocacy is championing businesses to make sure that they thrive under whatever circumstances, be it COVID, be it calamity, typhoon, whatever. And we help them to grow uh, and in a sustainable manner nationwide. Internationally, PCCI plays an important role in assisting its members by engaging them in trade and investment in the global economy. We play an active role in major international business organizations, such as the one who's hosting this meeting, COXI, and we participate to further strengthen international linkages and provides venues to engage with foreign partners. Our international reach also give us an opportunity to showcase the business climate of the Philippines and its market profile through our active participations in receiving inbound and sending outbound missions. PCCI is able to provide the vital conduit between Philippine businesses and international establishment. As part of COXI's 26 member countries and economies, representing a combined GDP of 18 trillion US dollars, BCCI takes pride in our active participations in COXI activities and initiatives that pursue economic development in the region. We hope that COXI Investment Forum Series will continue to capture the pulse of the region and be able to share to a wider audience the prospect and opportunities in Asia Pacific. Since rebounding from the challenges of COVID-19 pandemic, we, like other global economy, has started to regain its strength, but not without challenges. Inflation, raising food, cost, issues on energies and climates are some of the challenges that we face. It might not be the easiest of time, but our country is open for business and is supposed to become one of the Asia's powerhouse economy. With the exponential growth of our cities, our growing middle class, and solid economic foundations, young and skilled workforce embodying a modern and vibrant lifestyle, coupled with the government's unwavering commitment to achieve inclusive growth and development through its program and advocacy. According to the World Bank, Philippines has been growing in recent years, accelerating from 5.6% in 2021 to 7.6% in 2022. In addition, the World Bank projects the Philippine continued efforts will pave ways in moving in a direction from a lower middle income country with a gross national income per capita of 3,500 to somewhere in the vicinity of 10,000 by 2030. Notably, I'm delighted to share the good news with potential investors and, and uh, entrepreneurs. The enactment of laws such as the Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentives of Enterprise Law, better known as CREATE. This has significantly reduced our corporate income tax, aligning or pa in parity with our ASEAN neighbors. To CREATE, we anticipate attracting increased foreign investments and providing crucial support for the expansion of the small and medium-sized enterprises. Today, the speakers that are lined up to is or will share with you further in-depth analysis of why our country, the Philippines, is a prime destination for investment. Philippine Trade Undersecretary Dr. Seferino, better known as Perry Rudolfo, will present 
to doing business in the Philippines is beneficial and will introduce our EcoZone and the various incentives that they offer, uh, which will be presented by Director General of the Reso Panga from the Philippine Economic Zone Authority, better known as PESA. And on the issue of energy, we have Ms. Lisa Go, which will enlighten us on the energy aspect of the country for opportunities. Prospect in various sectors will be discussed. Our very own Vice President and in Industry and Director for Innovations and Science and Technology, uh, Vice President Perry Ferrer on ICT and Innovations. Likewise, our Vice President for Trade and International for Environment and Natural Resource, Resources, Vice President Architect June uh, Palafox will discuss issue on infrastructure and smart cities. And lastly, uh, the focus on agriculture will be presented by our Agriculture Committee co-chair, uh, Doi Salako. I would just like to end with uh, inviting you to our 49th Philippine Business Conference and Expo, which is uh, to be chaired by our Vice President Architect Jun Palafox with the theme, Vision 2050, the Philippines in the first world economy on October 25 and 26 of this year. We hope that COXI will, will send a business delegation to attend the PBC and uh, we would very much like to welcome you here. Once again, I extend our heartfelt appreciation to COXI and the speakers and the members and guests joining us. And we look forward to a productive forum this afternoon. Thank you very much, PCSI President George Barcelon. Next, we will now hear the opening message of the President of the Confederation of Asia Pacific Chambers of Commerce and Industry, or CASI. He has an extensive legal and business career, doing prominent roles in both the public and public private sectors. He is currently chairman and director of Macmillan Group, an investment company that specializes in commercial property development. He is also special counsel to Cornwall Stoddart Lawyers. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of CASI, Mr. Peter Macmillan. Well, good afternoon, um, and President Barcelon, uh, Secretary General David Sue, and distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be uh, speaking to you today. Um, I'm speaking to you from um, Geneva, where I'm attending the World Chambers Congress, which happens every two years. And um, the next World Chambers Congress will be happening in Melbourne, Australia, which is my hometown. And I look forward to welcoming you all there if you're able to uh, join us in uh, 2025. But uh, as I've uh, assumed the role of president of the Confederation of Asia Pacific Chambers of Commerce and Industry, otherwise known as CASI, uh, I have been um, impressed by the activity in many of our member countries. We have 26 uh, countries within the Asia Pacific region. And of course, the Philippines is a very prominent and important part of that uh, 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 mix of countries. And the Philippines Chamber of Commerce and Industry has been very actively involved with um, uh, CASI since 1966, when the organization was first established. There's been a prominent and active member in many of our forums and many of our occasions where we get together. And we've had conferences uh, in Manila and we've had um, different um, uh, events uh, uh, with the Philippines Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And we enjoy that relationship with many of our members, but uh, uh, the Philippines, of course, is a very prominent one. Um, and I've just recently returned from uh, two presidential visits, which I've led to Taiwan and to Vietnam. And uh, businesses join us on these delegations and the opportunity there is to understand the business conditions in those particular countries that we visit. 
and to forge and develop relationships between uh, business people in those countries. And uh, it's been a very successful model that has worked over many, many years. And um, we are going to hopefully uh, bring a, a presidential visit to the Philippines um, uh, before too long. Uh, obviously with 26 countries, we can't go to them all, all at once. So uh, we'll get to the Philippines as soon as we possibly can. But uh, I note that uh, you have this uh, expo in uh, October. And I think that uh, will be a great opportunity for us to participate actively in that event in the lead up to our own annual conference in Phnom Penh in Cambodia on the October the 30th and the 31st of this year. So I take this opportunity to uh, welcome and invite any of the participants in today's webinar um, to join us in Phnom Penh in October following the expo that you're having uh, in, um, in earlier in October. But uh, look, my presidency has basically been um, uh, developed around getting business set for the future. And as the president has said, there are many challenges facing us all at the moment. And uh, I have uh, uh, said that we should focus our energies on three main principles. Uh, one is sustainability, one is in entrepreneurialism, and third is trade. That's SET, getting set for the future. And that's a very much a component of how we're going to organise the activities of the Confederation over the, over the period uh, going forward. So it's really important that we continue to engage with each other. And I look forward to hearing all the exciting developments that have occurred within the Philippines uh, throughout uh, today's webinar, because I think um, uh, it will showcase and these opportunities are important to showcase uh, what uh, business is doing in the different countries. And uh, I'm sure the Philippines presentations today will uh, uplift not only the participants today, but the future uh, generations uh, of Philippine people uh, through all the work that you've done and put, put to make this a successful day. So uh, I'll conclude my opening remarks with that and just to I congratulate you all on organising this event and I wish you all the best for a very successful uh, webinar. Thank you. Indeed, we are very excited to present to you a lineup of distinguished resource persons who will impart their expertise, experiences and ideas on the opportunities for investments in the Philippines. Our first speaker is a very close friend of PCCI the Honorable Undersecretary of the Department of Trade and Industry, Seferino S. Rodolfo. Yusak Perry has been, the lead, has been leading the crafting and implementation of the Philippine Industrial Policy and International Trade Negotiation Agenda. Notable among his accomplishments is his role in the successful negotiation of the Philippines-European Free Trade Association Free Trade Agreement, the Philippines' application to the EU GSP Plus program, and the Philippines-South Korea Free Trade Agreement. Our resource speaker is also the managing head of the Board of Investments. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Seferino S. Rodolfo. So a good day to everyone. And Peter, let me just say that uh, I really wish that you could lead a presidential mission of the CASI to the Philippines. Uh, so that you can see for yourself the dynamic uh, developments that we are having in the country and that uh, we are fully aligned with your pri the pri priorities of your presidency, uh, sustainability, entrepreneurship, and trade. As you can see later on, these are exactly also the pillars that uh, where we are hinging the Philippine economic development and our drive to attract more investments, in particular, on the sustainability and on the trade aspect. We are happy to share with everyone that the Philippines is definitely on a steady march towards recovery coming from the pandemic. Last year, our GDP, our gross domestic product, expanded by 7.6%, which is the third highest GDP growth in ASEAN in 2022. Now, for the first quarter of 2023, GDP posted a growth of 6.4%, which is really one of the highest, if not in ASEAN, in Asia, 
and in 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 the world uh, next slide please also in terms of the country's index for manufacturing known as the purchasing managers index or pmi it stood at 52.9 percent on average in the first quarter of 2023 slightly surpassing the 52 pmi score recorded during the same period of 2022 this signals further improvement in operating conditions according to the SNP uh, Global uh, Organization. Uh, next slide, please. Very important also, the Philippines jumped to the 43rd spot in the latest World Bank 2023 Logistics Performance Index, the country's highest ranking in, logis in their logistics report since 2007. The country got a score of 3.3 and was tied with seven other economies, including Vietnam. According to the report that ranks countries based on ease of establishing reliable supply chain connections, quality of logistic services, infrastructure, timelines, and uh, border controls. Uh, next slide, please. Another important uh, uh, macroeconomic indicator that I would like to share is that our total export earnings in 2022 represented an annual increase of 5.6% that already amounted to almost $80 billion, which is even higher than the pre-pandemic le level of uh, only $70 billion in 2019. Uh, last year, our export growth was driven by strong sales of electronic products and very important, other mineral products. When I say other mineral products, this refer mainly to green metals or green min minerals such as uh, copper, cobalt, and uh, nic nickel, minerals that are very important as the world shifts to greater or puts not just a premium, but an imperative on sustainability. Um, next slide, please. Add to that, there are improvements in the delivery of government services, especially after the passage of the Ease of Doing Business Act, which catap catapulted our competitiveness ranking from just 124th in 2019 to 95th in 2020. Under the same the said act, the Philippine Business Hub, a one-stop business portal, was launched to make business transactions easier and faster. This seeks to streamline the registration of business, renewal of permits, and other activities through online transactions. The uh, administration of President Marcos Jr. also has committed really to further streamline and accelerate digitalization in the Philippines, starting off with our government processes. As an offshoot, an executive order was issued for the creation of green lanes in government agencies for strategic investments, which would expedite and streamline the processes and requirements for issuing permits and licenses. This is uh, under the executive order number 18. Next slide, please. Now, we zoom into a series of major and game-changing policy reforms and accelerated program interventions that have helped position the Philippines towards stronger post-economic recovery. These major policy shifts shall complement the Ease of Doing Business Act and attract more global players that will modernize several of our sex sectors, such as retail, technology, startups, telecoms, shipping, among others. Uh, next slide. To start off, uh, let me discuss the corporate recovery and tax incentives for enterprises, or what we call as CREATE Act, which was signed in March 2021. It rationalizes and modernizes and offers more relevant incentives for companies and investors. Under this CREATE Act, qualified projects can enjoy incentives of up to 17 years of income tax holiday, followed by 5% preferential tax rate, or a choice to go for enhanced deductions depending on the location, market orientation, and industry tier. After the income tax holiday period, export market activities have the option of availing of 10 years of either, as I said, enhanced deduction or 5% special corporate income tax. Oh, sorry, I'm being prompted that uh, I have to uh, cut short on my presentation. Anyway, just to mention that the activities that are uh, that would be eligible for these income tax holidays and uh, lower corporate income tax are enumerated under the strategic in uh, next slide please under the strategic investment priorities plan where there are several tiers 
tier 1, tier 2, and tier 3 uh, cluster of activities. And we will also be uh, distributing these uh, materials for your so that you can further review on your own pleasure. Thank you. Next slide, please. Another Philippine game-changing policy, which was uh, issued a year ago, is the amendment of our retail trade uh, liberalization, which simplified and eased further the restrictions imposed on foreign retailers that wish to set up shop in the Philippines. Previously, the investment requirement for foreign retailers who will enter the Philippines was pegged at $2.5 million. It was further lowered to $500,000. Next slide. A foreign, invest, foreign Investment Act was also uh, amended and signed into law last March 2022. Now the Philippines can be a second home for startup firms involved in advanced technology with capital requirement of only $100,000 and a requirement to employ only 15 employees. Next slide, please. Now, very important, Philippines also amended our Public Service Act. Uh, which has now allowed up to 100% foreign ownership of public services in the country, specifically in telecom, shipping, air carriers, railways, subways, airports, and toll roads. Essentially, almost all sectors in the Philippines are allowed 100% foreign equity ownership, except for the list of uh, sectors that you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, just to enumerate, this would be distribution of electricity, transmission of electricity, petroleum and petroleum products, pipeline transmission systems, water pipeline distribution systems, seaports, and public utility vehicles. All other sectors are, in essence, you are allowed 100% uh, foreign ownership. Next slide. After these game-changing reforms, this slide shows you the, uh, the companies that have already invested in the Philippines. In particular, for the Board of Investments, we have tallied 655 billion pesos worth of investment approvals in 2021, posting a 218% surge in foreign direct investments despite pandemic-related challenges. Now, that was in 2021. Next slide, please. Moving forward, in 2022, um, uh, our net FDI inflows for the Philippines recorded $28 billion dollars from 2020 to 2022, majority of the equity placements came from Singapore, Japan, US, Malaysia, and Taiwan. Next slide, please. Equally important, you could see in this slide that the Philippines ranking in terms of investment destination among ASEAN countries have already improved from just sixth place when you look at the 2012 to 2016 average FDI inflow. It has already improved to fourth place in 2017 to 2021. Our goal is to be the second most preferred destination for FDI in the ASEAN region by the end of President Marcos Jr.'s term. Next slide. Uh, I'll skip this next slide. Now, let me just focus on this particular slide. Philippines, we are uh, positioning the Philippines as the regional hub for sustainability connectivity, and innovation-driven manufacturing and services. Under this man uh, positioning strategy, our priority sectors are at the very base of this positioning strategy would be to encourage more renewable energy projects as well as data centers and telecom infrastructure projects. Now, moving up further, the, the next sectors that we are encouraging would be green metals, in particular processing of minerals that are important for the production of batteries. So in particular, nickel, copper, and cobalt. And then also encourage high-tech agriculture. All the way to eventually we would like to be able to assemble electric vehicles, expand further our high-tech light manufacturing sector, as well as um, continue dominance of the Philippines in terms of outsourced semiconductor assembly and testing. Next slide, please. Uh, let me summarize everything by citing the biggest Philippine advantage, and that is our rich talent pool and the fact that we are now in a demographic sweet spot. Next slide, please. If you look at the age of a uh, Philippi uh, median age in the Philippines, uh, we Philipp, we are proud to say that the Philippines represent the youngest workforce among the five founding members of ASEAN with a median age of 26 years old. We have more years ahead in terms of being able to provide resilient, creative, productive, and capable human resource pool 
with increasing income that also makes for an attractive and growing consumer base. Uh, from a population of 110 million people, our uh, human resource pool or workforce stands at 51.2 million. Next slide, please. This translates to the Philippines having a very competitive salary and steady, steady wage increase for manufacturing. If you look at the Philippines uh, in a 2022 JETRO survey, the wage increase for manufacturing industry in the Philippines has been steady at just 4.5%, lower than our neighboring countries, in particular Vietnam, whose, uh, whose uh, manufacturing industry uh, wages has increased at 5.5% and Indonesia at 4.6%. Next slide, please. Equally important for e employers who exhibit commitment to their workers, you will reap the benefit of the very low turnover rate in the Philippines, one of the lowest in the region at 1.9%. Companies will also enjoy industrial peace in our country. The incidence of strikes and lockouts in the country is very minimal. Like for example, in 2020, our uh, strikes and lockouts already stood at 11. Next slide, please. Besides our huge domestic market, given the 110 million population of the Philippines, the Philippines has preferential access in major markets through our free trade agreements and our being beneficiary of the generalized system of preference programs of most major economies. Next slide, please. Uh, let me just mention, uh, make special mention, as I said earlier, the Philippines is an ideal location for sustainable and innovation manufacturing and services, for clean technology, renewable energy sources, as we have the necessary precursors to lessen emission of greenhouse gases and create a circular economy. We are backed up by a substantial resource base of 400 million metric tons of nickel, 4 million metric tons of copper, and 260,000 uh, metric tons of cobalt, and the government's strong commitment to say sustainability Local and foreign investors could very well take full advantage of our rich natural resources in collaborating with the Philippines in further processing these green minerals. We are currently the number one exporter of nickel direct shipping ore in the country, in the world. Next slide, please. As so as I, I'll skip this because uh, my, my colleague, um, Ms. Lisa Go from the Department of Energy will be presenting this anyway, but just to say that we are hinging our economic development moving forward on greater use of renewable energy. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Ah, sorry, just keep it there. Uh, back up one slide, please. To wrap up my presentation, allow me once again to invite you to take advantage of our economic growth trajectory our inherent comparative advantages, and the benefits from the recent game-changing laws that have opened up businesses and great opportunities for foreign investors. Make your investments happen in the Philippines. Make it happen now. Thank you for your kind uh, attention. Thank you. Next, the PCC Vice President for Industry and Director for Digital Science and Technology. He is the chairman and CEO of EMS Group of Companies, a complete electronic semiconductor and medical subcontracting group that provides technology and manufacturing solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, Vice President of PCI, Mr. Ferdinand Perer. Uh, thank you, Edwin, and good afternoon to PCCI President, Mr. George Barcelon, CASI President, Peter McMullen, a good friend, uh, DTI Undersecretary for Industry Development and Trade Policy, Dr. Seferino Rodolfo, uh, PESA Director General, DG Teo Panga, PCCI Chairman, Dr. William Co, CASI officers and members, my PCCI colleagues, fellow speakers, guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and good evening for some. It is my honor to be part of this virtual business forum. My appreciation to the Confederation of Asia Pacific Chambers of Commerce and Industry or CASI for inviting the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry to co-organize this event featuring the Philippines as a premier investment destination. Innovation 
has always been on top of PCCI's agenda. The chamber created a committee dedicated to promoting technology and innovation to PCCI's members and affiliated associations. Recognizing the role of innovation as crucial in the growth of the Philippine economy, PCCI is developing our web portal and vision to be the hub of all core services to our members, including business matching for both local and foreign. We aim to make this portal the go-to for international companies when they look for potential counterparts, products, services, or partners in the Philippines, inclusive of our local chamber members, numbering over 40,000 businesses across the country. As the majority of PCCI's members are from the small and medium enterprises, the chamber has teamed up with the United States Agency for International Development or USAID through the Project SPEED or Strengthening Private Enterprise for the Digital Economy to deepen the SME's involvement in the e-commerce networks. The SPEED project also has the SME Academy e-commerce portal to feature programs for SMEs to facilitate their adoption of technology in their business, such as capacity building programs and mentorships on MSME's digitalization, information on markets, and advisory services, amongst others. The Alliance will take the lead in the conduct of policy dialogues on prevailing issues in relation to digital transformation and inclusion of private enterprises. PCCI created the Innovation and Digital Technology Committee to help facilitate the transformation of MSMEs and industries to the digital economy and industry 4.0. This is where our global partners like yourselves and their core competencies come into play. Instead of reinventing or starting from scratch, together with our local and foreign partners, we will collaborate and integrate best, best practices to accelerate the Philippines' digital transformation. Some areas where our alliance are focusing are access to high-speed internet in rural areas, digital content creation, marketing, fintech like e-payments and e-wallets, marketplace creation and expansion, logistics, supply chain, employee upskilling, and many more. So this is an opportunity for all. Another important program is of the PCCI is the Smarter Philippines Through Data Analytics. R&D training and adoption, or we called it the SPARTA program. This is in collaboration with the Government's Development Academy of the Philippines, or DAP, providing our members free scholarships on short-term courses in data science and analytics. Data will be the future goldmine of companies. The scholarship aims to develop data analysts, data scientists, engineers, data managers to help transform companies into the digital economy. Data can transform companies to a more efficient and well-guided decision-making process. This coming July, PCCI will co-organize with the Department of Information Technology and Communications or the DICT an investors or an ICT investors forum with the objective of accelerating the implementation of nationwide digital and internet connectivity through a PPP or a public private partnership program with both local and foreign companies. The future of the Philippines 
entering into global market hinges on the digitalization of our businesses and government services. This has been the goal of the government as well as PCCI to be able to connect the whole country through the internet and to fast track the country's rural development. You know, the areas where what are being considered for the DICT PPP programs are, I'll just name three, fiber enabled free public internet access, fiber optic backbone conduit using the national railroad right of way, the regional internet access rings in islands connecting government and educational services. This is another opportunity where our foreign partners could participate in the Philippines digital transformation. Based on the World Intellectual Property Organization or WIPO report, the Philippines ranked 59 in the 2022 Global Index, GII, performing best in business sophistication. Quoting on the same report, WIPO recognized the Philippines as one of the middle income economies with the fastest innovation catch up program to date, along with China, India, Iran, and Vietnam. However, the country needs to sustain this innovation effort using our international partners, the chamber in our various dialogues with foreign business organizations and the diplomatic community. They are keen on inviting technology innovators and investors to partner with PCCI in improving our technological competence and knowledge performance to modernize agriculture and agribusiness, enhance services and industry outputs, sharpen our IT expansion amongst others. We have been in discussions with prospective partners in Israel, India, Japan, the United States and Taiwan, just to mention a few on specific technologies that we can collaborate to push for the growth of the Philippines innovation sector. We are appreciative of this positive response we received to explore possible technology transfer or knowledge, sharing on agriculture and water management, FinTech, cybersecurity, and healthcare, manufacturing, and other industries. These are major events and visits of foreign delegations that PCCI is set to hold in the second half of this year. Notably, as we heard earlier, the 49th Business Conference and Expo in where technologies is one of the key components of the business event. The chairman of this year's PBC is our Vice President Architect, June Palafox, and he will provide more insights on this year's event later on this afternoon. Let PCCI be your channel for creating partnerships and broadening uh, you, your reach in the country. Again, the chamber is ready and willing to work with local and foreign companies and institutions and learn from the experts to enhance the Philippines innovation system. In closing, I am grateful for this opportunity to present PCCI's plans on information technology and innovation and how we can move together to achieve our common aspirations. Thank you and mabuhay. Our, Our next speaker next... is a well-known visionary architect, urban and environmental planner. He has traveled to and observed more than a thousand cities in 79 countries, and is an active member of various local and international organizations, such as the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, the American Institute of Architects, among others. Please join me in welcoming architect Filipino Afelino June Palafox Jr., PCCI Vice President for Trade Affairs and Director for Environment, 
Natural Resources and Climate Change. He's also the chairman this year of the 49th Philippine Business Conference and Expo. And actually, he has just arrived an hour ago from the United Arab Emirates, where he was bestowed the UAP Dubai Awards 2023 First Lifetime Achievement Award. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our Vice President Felino June Palafox Jr. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Glad to be here. And uh, I, I, I participated in the preparation of the Philippine Development Plan as a consultant uh, assigned by the uh, Asian Development Bank. And I see a lot of very high development potential for our country. If I may cite some of them, we are number one in the world in marine biodiversity. We're number one now in call centers. We're number one in number of sailors and seamen. We're number two in geothermal energy. We're number two now in BPOs. We have the third or fifth longest coastline in the world. We're number four in gold reserves. Number four also in shipbuilding, thanks to the Japanese and the, the Koreans. And number five in all other mineral resources. And as our President George uh, Barcelona would, uh, would cite, we have a very soft demographic spot. The average age is uh, 26 years old. And as uh, Yusuf Ferry also, he mentioned many of the advantages of our country. In fact, with, with the uh, Department of Trade Industry, we, we, we are promoting a master plan, the Leyte Ecological Industrial Road, uh, 800 hectares primary for copper, many industries. And uh, as Edwin mentioned, I just came back from Dubai. And a lot this morning, and a lot of inquiries and investment here. In fact, one of the largest port operators in the world, Dubai Ports World, is already investing in two of our ports uh, in the Philippines. And we see that uh, by 2050, we should be uh, uh, a first world economy according to the forecast of uh, Goldman Sachs and HSBC, number 16th economy in the world by 2050. And by 2050, we forecast there will be 150 million uh, population. And we, we would be needing at least 100 new cities. Hopefully, uh, there will be smart cities, and that's, that's the advocacy we're having also, both from CCI and, and our, our, our company. And... and uh, it's really open and a lot of, uh, for business, a lot of uh, inquiries happening now. And may we invite you to the uh, 49th Philippine Business Conference and Expo, the largest business conference in our country, sponsored by the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry on October 25-26. And there are all, a lot of uh, interested uh, participants and, and uh, exhibitors. And this is uh, uh, keynoted by the Vice President uh, and uh, and the president and leadership industry and government in our country and elsewhere in the world will be participating. So we look forward for your participation in our 49 Philippine Business Conference, October 25 and 26. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Our next our resource next person is a former undersecretary of the Department of Agriculture. He banks on his long experience working with the government as he serves as PCI co-chair for the Agriculture and Fishery Committee, taking the lead role in increasing productivity and modernizing the country's agriculture sector towards food security and competitiveness. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Mr. Salvador Salaku. This afternoon, I am tasked to talk about the opportunities in Philippine agriculture. I'm delighted for the opportunity to be sharing with you this industry that I served for about 15 years as an employee of the Ministry of Agriculture. Surely this is one topic I am passionate about and I hope that we would be able to convince you in investing in Philippine agriculture and Philippine agribusiness. The Philippines is blessed with an environment and climate that is conducive to a year-round greenhouse setup. We are an archipelagic country with around 7,100 islands, 
covering 300,000 square kilometers. Of these, 298,000 square kilometers are of land and 1,830 is considered as water. We have nearly over 14 million hectares of alienable and disposable land, of which nearly 10 million are suitable for agriculture. In 2021, the contribution of agriculture, forestry, and fishing industry to the country's gross domestic product was around 9.6%. Over the past six years, the sector's contribution remained below 6% wherein, in fact, it could reach to include 30 to 45 percent, including support in allied services. The services industry, on the other hand, has the highest contribution to the Philippine GDP. In terms of employment, farming and fishing industry constitute nearly 25 percent, or 10 million of the nearly 60 million Filipinos who live in the rural areas. As you can see in the slide, uh, Philippine agriculture and agribusiness is comprised of three major components. These are processed food, fresh food, and marine products. For the past years, our agriculture sector has un unfortunately been underperforming. As you can see in the slide, in year 2021 and 2022, we posted a trade deficit of 6.4 million and $9.8 million respectively. This goes to show you that we import more of our agricultural commodities than exporting them. These are some of the food that we export, and we are very strong in edible fruits and nuts, citrus uh, commodities, melons, which is valued at around $1.93 billion. This comprise a large share of 28.5% of the total agricultural exports. On the other hand, cereals, particularly rice, rank the highest among our imports at around $3.1 billion. Among ASEAN member countries, Malaysia was a top destination of agricultural exports worth around $247.9 million, or a share of 32.3% to the total agricultural exports to ASEAN member countries. Other trading partners in the region, such as Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore, and Vietnam, registered considerable uh, business links with our country. The top three major agricultural commodities exported to ASEAN member countries in 2021 were tobacco and manufactured tobacco substitutes, animal or vegetable fats. I believe this is more of coconut oil. And of course, preparation of cereals, flour, starch or milk, pastry cooks products worth around 62 million US dollars. Looking at the European Union and other uh, member countries, the Netherlands were the top country's top buyer of agriculture commodities worth 698 million dollars. I believe this would be accounted for the shipments of coconut oil, specifically in the trade, uh, trading area of the uh, Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Spain was also a big user of Philippine products. Uh, on likewise, on the contrary, it was also a big supplier of agricultural commodities. We imported around 333 million US dollars or a share of 20.6% to the total agricultural exports from EU member countries in 2021. Let's look at the programs being launched by President uh, Bongbong Marcos Jr. in his first State of the Nation address. Uh, President Ferdinand Marcos Jr., who is also the concurrent chief of the Department of Agriculture said, that he will focus on the development of Philippine agriculture, recognizing the sector's contribution as one of the drivers for employment and growth of the country. The Philippine Agriculture Roadmap, as seen on the slide, actually was uh, started in the last administration of President Duterte, but then 
as uh, President Marcos has emphasized on agriculture for his current administration, uh, he has improved on this, focusing on consolidation, modernization, industrialization, and professionalization. It includes strategies such as farm mechanization and infrastructure investments, climate change adaptation and mitigation measures, global trade, export development and promotion, education and training, agribusiness management, youth and women engagement, and ease of doing business and transparent procurement. I recall about a month ago, the president announced that he will identify food zones all over the country and that he would like to focus likewise on storage systems and logistic systems to help our farmers and fishers bring them closer to the end markets. Looking at our top export commodities, next slide please. In terms of fresh produce, mango is the third most important fruit crop in the Philippines and next to banana and pineapple. However, its production has been on the downtrend due to a number of issues. One among them would be pests and diseases, climate change, and the failure to adopt cultural practices such as fertilization, pruning, and fruit bagging. Another commodity export under the banana category is uh, cardava banana. Frozen banana and banana chips are becoming known in other countries and has a huge potential to grow. The Philippines is the second largest producer of and exporter of fresh pineapples next to Thailand. Northern Mindanao is the top producing region for pineapples in the Philippines, accounting for an average of 61% of the annual crop. Again, there is also a growing demand for export and industrial markets, especially toward processing pineapples into frozen chunks, powders, juices, purees, and concentrates. Local markets are inclined toward pineapple-based candies, jams, and pastries. Moreover, another important industry, coconut, in the Philippines is the second largest producer of coconuts in the world, next to Indonesia. There is also a growing market demand for young coconut and coconut water. The global coconut water market has reached $6.4 billion in 2022. Coconut water is the clear liquid found inside green coconuts. These are some of the country's top exports in terms of fresh produce. In the area of marine industry, the Philippines ranks among the major producing countries in the world, and tuna is our top export. The industry provides employment to approximately 2 million Filipinos. Next slide, please. The dairy industry is something that the government is trying to develop. 99%, please listen to this closely, 99% of our milk requirement is imported. and We only produce less than 1% of our total annual dairy requirement. We source our milk from New Zealand, USA, Netherlands, and Australia. Although beset with many issues and challenges, the livestock and poultry sector has been at the forefront of production growth. It has been a major contributor to the agriculture sector and provides growth to many Filipinos in the rural areas. Growth in consumption largely drives the expansion of industries that include Metro Manila, Cebu, and Davao. Other potential areas for investment are in the following sectors, shrimp production, native chicken production, duck production, and of course, seaweeds. Finally, the PCCI, together with private sector, has embarked on a digitalized market linkage platform, and this is AgriFood Hub. We link our farmers with the chosen and preferred markets at the consumption level. To date, we have around 4,000 farmers enlisted in this platform and around 600 major traders, restaurant groups, hotels, and of course, exporters and processors at the demand side. Ladies and gentlemen, we offer this platform to those who are willing to invest with us 
and invest in our beloved country. Up next, let us talk about prospects in the renewable energy sector, a crucial component to sustain the country's economic growth. Our next speaker shall talk about the latest regulations and priority programs that will stimulate development and entice investments in the renewable energy sector. We are pleased to present to you Ms. Lisa S. Go, Chief of the Investment Promotion Office of the Department of Energy. On the renewable energy outlook uh, from 2021 to 2040, we have a target of 52,826 megawatts of additional capacity uh, from re renewable energy sources, which is needed by 2040, and which is equivalent to six times of the current level of this year. So on the slide on your right uh, shows the various energy resources uh, and the, time, the capacity needed on a specific year. Um, this is based on the National Renewable Energy Program, uh, which from 2020 to 2040, which targets 35% uh, of renewable energy share in the power generation mix by 2030, and increasing this further to 50% by 2040. So as of 2022, uh, Renewable energy has contributed to 29% of the installed capacity and 22% of the gross power generation of the country. Shown on the screen are the, uh, the installed capacity, uh, wherein we have coal leading, but renewable energy um, is following uh, closely. So as mentioned, the, the slide just shows the numbers of uh, renewable energy contracts awarded, which is an indication of the increasing interest on renewable energy development in the country. We have a total um, of four for, renew for hydro, we have various resources and the service contracts, the numbers are indicated on screen with the potential capacity and installed capacities. We have also existing policies and mechanisms and incentives that are the drivers for the development of renewable energy in the country. We sent issuance, his executive number 21, which directs the establishment of a policy and a framework for shore uh, wind projects in the Philippines. We also have the Green Energy Auction Program which is a bidding process for uh, renewable energy participants. We also have an existing renewable portfolio standards in off-grid areas. And developing a renewable energy project in the Philippines will have preferential dispatch in the wholesale electricity spot market. We also have the Green Energy Option Program where the end users or consumers uh, will have the option to obtain their sources from renewable energy. Also, we have the renewable portfolio standards in off-grid areas. And for consumers as well, we have the net metering program where the consumers could um, generate electricity as uh, up to 100 kilowatts for own use. In addition uh, to these policies and mechanisms, we also have incentives which are administered by the Board of Investments. Going deeper into the Green Energy Auction Program, we last year, the July 2022, we had um, successfully undertaken the Green Energy Auction, the first Green Energy Auction, with 1,866.13 megawatts. Um, in July this year, we will be launching the second uh, Green Energy Auction uh, for or with 11,600 megawatts to be bidded up. Uh, upcoming, we will look forward to the Green Energy Auction Program, uh, which will have a city of 10,478 megawatts. We also have the enabling laws and issuances, which will 
which facilitates the entry of um, investments in the country. So we have the ease of doing business law, and we also have the Energy Virtual One Stop Shop Act, which involves the streamlining of processes to be able to fast track the issuance or secure, securing of various permits necessary for the implementation of uh, renewable energy projects. We also have the omnibus guidelines for the administration of renewable energy contracts, administration of renewable energy and the registration of renewable energy developers. Um, recently, um, the renewable energy sector allowed 100% uh, foreign ownership for renewable energy projects. And with, with this recent policy, we would be expecting more um, investments in the renewable energy sector. Uh, as mentioned, the recent executive order is to promote and encourage the implementation of offshore wind, wherein um, the intent is really to expedite the permitting process and approval process for offshore wind projects in the country. So as mentioned, as part of the facilitation of the permitting process, we have the Energy Virtual One Stop Shop Act, which um, implements part of the implementation is the implementation of the Energy Virtual One Stop Shop system, where all applications are lodged online and um, will follow a prescribed timeline as stated in the law. So this in terms gives a definite time frame for a developer in implementing an energy project in the area. Okay, so far we have now in government uh, offices and entities already in the system, and we are hoping to add more uh, agencies and entities particularly involved in the implementation of the energy projects, and hopefully also will include uh, agencies and entities involved in the implementation of offshore wind energy projects. Okay, um, just to give you more further information on offshore wind potential, we have a total of let me go back. We have a total of 178 gigawatts of offshore wind potential in the country, with 18 gig gigawatts fixed and 160 gigawatts um, floating uh, offshore wind. Um, there are six potential sites or zones identified, and this is where we would like to encourage investors to come in. Um, so we have these zones with this potential capacity shown on screen. As of today, we have a number of service contracts awarded already for offshore wind, and this is uh, spread from the northern part of the zone down to the Visayas region. Um, current activities are on the gathering of wind data and application for endorsements and requests for system impact study from the National Corporation of the Philippines. Another area that would um, provide, um, would encourage investors to come in is pre-identified areas for renewable energy zones. So we call this, uh, or otherwise known as CRES. It has identified 25 strategic areas for solar and wind energy projects in the country with a potential capacity of 58,000 megawatts for solar and 92,000 megawatts for wind. So shown on screen also are the potentials um, for geothermal, hydropower, and biomass spread all over uh, the three regions in the country. So with all these requirements uh, for the development of renewable energy, we have a total investment requirement of 97 billion US dollars uh, with renewable with various um, areas for the pre-development, construction, or biofuels production. So renewable energy is a, only a part of the entire um, clean energy scenario. Uh, being pursued by the Department of Energy. This is coupled with other aspects such as energy security, sustainable energy resilient infrastructure and competitive energy structures, implementation of smart homes and cities and empowered consumers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Lisa Go of the Department of Energy. 
We are very honored to have as our last resource person, <clears throat> no less than the Director General of the Philippine Economic Zone Authority, Mr. Tereso Paul Pangan. As the principal agency in charge of the EcoZone program, I now present to you the investment opportunities in the Philippine Economic Zones, particularly for our investors from the Asia-Pacific region. Taking the cue from our president, President Ferdinand Marcos, with this statement saying that the Philippines is a smart investment choice and that the best investment destination is the Philippines, of course, and that the best time to invest in the Philippines is now. And in the Philippines, there is this investment promotion agency, which is the Philippine Economic Zone Authority that can provide for the best location and ecosystem for our investors through the incentives that we administer to our locator investors, which we manage nationwide. We're able to generate uh, much contributions to the economy. In 2022 alone, PESA accounted for almost 17% of the country's GDP, 56% of the total country's annual exports of commodities and goods, and 51% of service exports. On PESA performance, just like the other economies, the rest of the economies, we were affected by the global COVID pandemic. As you can see, the sliding investment approvals from 2020 to 2021. But in 2022, we were able to recover, achieving 103% increase in investments, which uh, puts us back now to pre-pandemic level. In January to May 2023, we were able to sustain this growth momentum with our investments, the number of projects and employment. And so we are on track with our 10% growth target this year. We see the same growth uh, increase in terms of our exports. You can see there that for January to March, we account for 62% of the total country's exports. Uh, in terms of our share, this is higher than our share last year at 54%. And about 61% of these total ecozone exports come actually from our locators from Asia Pacific region. In terms of dispersal of our eco zones and the locator industries, 66% are located outside Metro Manila. To date, we are now hosting 422 operating economic zones nationwide, broken down uh, into IT parks and centers, manufacturing, agro-industrial parks, tourism, medical tourism. These are home to 4,372 locator companies nationwide. And uh, these are mostly export oriented. We are also venturing into new frontiers and eco zone development with the new types of eco zones that we are promoting to be able to attract niche industries. If I may mention some like Aerotropolis, this is an eco zone development around an airport, aquamarine parks where we want to promote mariculture, marine energy, and marine regeneration. We're also into knowledge innovation, science, and technology parks where we have approved already some colleges and state universities as host to these uh, companies into R&D and innovation, as well as mineral processing economic zones as the Philippines is the fifth mineralized country in the world. In terms of our locator investments by nationality, we have Japanese as our number one investor, followed by Filipinos, Americans, Dutch, etc. And then for locator investments by product sector, electronics and IT services are, are our top two uh, product sector investments, followed by metals, tourism, transport, and so on. In this slide, you will see the companies and investments that we are hosting from 17 member countries of the Asia Pacific out of 28. And you will see there that our top investors from this region are the Japanese, followed by Filipinos, Singaporean, South Korean, Taiwanese, and the Chinese, generating as much as $40 billion in annual exports. 
and where 41% of the total investments of PESA from the economic zones come from these countries from Asia-Pacific region. With our recent accession to RCEP, we aim to attract uh, investments from non-traditional sources such as China, New Zealand, Australia, and India. These are some of our international recognitions on PESA's uh, ease of doing business by IFC World Bank when it said that PESA is a shiny example of successful regulatory reform, improving overall investment climate in the country. This was a survey conducted among 77 economic zones worldwide. At the height of the pandemic in 2020, the U.S. Department of State came out with this investment climate statement saying that the business environment is notably better within the special economic zones under PESA, known for its regulatory transparency, no red tape policy, and one-stop shop services for investors, and uh, also by ASEAN UNTAD when it recognizes the role of PESA as a major investment facilitation institution in the country. With regard to the fiscal and non-fiscal incentives offered by PESA, May I just highlight that uh, the length of the incentives that we offer to our investors, which ranges from four, four to 17 years of income tax holiday and special corporate income tax equivalent to 5% gross income tax, is uh, actually longer than the 5 to 15 years length of uh, running of incentives across ASEAN. And if any investor is putting up a big ticket investments with minimum capital investment of $1 billion, the president under the great regime is authorized to grant a 40-year uh, income tax holiday and special corporate income tax. This is longer than what Vietnam gave to Samsung for 30 years of income tax holiday. On the non-fiscal incentives, Locators in PESA are not uh, exposed to any VAT payments. They don't go through any VAT refund process. And uh, we allow for employment of foreign nationals. If you're export-oriented, we can allow you to, to sell as much as 30% with the local market. You can lease land for as long as 75 years. And that in PESA, we issue our own visa, which is valid for two years and can be issued not just to the expats, but including their dependents. This has been our selling point since 1995 to investors with our brand of service. PESA is a one-stop shop because for all your permits, you just have to deal with PESA. You don't have to deal with the local government. We are also a non-stop shop as we provide round-the-clock service on-site to our investors to keep up with the demands of our agile locators. In terms of digitalization and other office automation measures, we're among the very first few in government to have ventured into paperless and cashless transactions for further improvement of our ease of doing business. These are some of the projects, activities that we register in PESA with incentives. Following our strategic investment priority plan, we give uh, priority to investors in ecozone development. So these are the ones that uh, develop the land into economic zones, like we have EPCs, agro-industrial parks, IT centers, which will serve as ready for occupancy sites for our what we call locator companies, which are your export-oriented. They can also be domestic market-oriented. They can be into manufacturing, refinery, processing, even IT services. And uh, we also grant incentives to those that provide facilities, utilities to support the operations of our locators. These are the embedded power, water, telecom, uh, providing service, quality, utilities for our locators. And in terms of the priority sectors, these are the seven sectors that we are promoting in PESA, like advanced manufacturing. We want uh, electronics, the high-tech ones, those that are into autonomous vehicle, IoT devices, smart home technology, uh, extractives for mineral processing, agriculture and blue industries, 
IT services, including frontier technologies, which are into AI, fintech, blockchain, and data centers. Uh, architect Palafox mentioned about smart city and township development, which is consistent with our model for eco-industrial park development, following the template of the World Bank that eco zones must be subscribing to SDGs, low carbon, circular economy type, energy efficient, uh, as well as science, technology, and innovation. And we're putting emphasis also on the integration of SMEs, these are the Filipino producers, into the EcoZone value chain for more horizontal integration to be able to support the viability of operations of our locator companies. In the following slides, you will see the top Fortune 500. These are the global in industry leaders already being hosted by PESA. In the electronics, these are your top EMS, SMS, SMS brands that are known to everyone. In automotive, we are able to do completely built units as all component parts to make a vehicle. They are all already present in the Philippines, preparing us for uh, entry of e-vehicles. Next. And then we almost... Almost all printer companies are already in the Philippines. These are mostly by Japanese companies. IT services, the leading BPO for voice and non-voice are likewise in the Philippines. Same with agro-processing that uh, provides for global requirements of all processed fruit, food, you see familiar brands like Dole, Cargill, Del Monte, and even for rubber, plastic, and paper products, all of these are now present in the Philippines. And uh, we look forward as well to hosting more companies, global leaders that support the operations of these companies. And as our assurance of support for our investors, we have no less than the president providing support to our investors with the issuance of EO, EO18, uh, providing for green lanes for our investors, and also placing emphasis on the strategic importance of the economic zones to be able to attract high tech and strategic industries. We play a key role in the medium-term development plan with the EcoZone program in terms of propelling the economic growth. And so in closing, may we invite our investors, our friends from Asia Pacific, region to come and visit the Philippines as an enviable destination, not just for business, but more so for travel and leisure, coupled with our warm Filipino culture and very friendly Filipinos. See you soon in the Philippines. Thank you. Mabuhay. We now go to the open forum, Director General Fanga. The question is a, a little interesting. How can the government guarantee the sanctity of contracts? with foreign investors. The DG, would you like to answer that question? Well, uh, yes. Thank you for that uh, question, uh, Edwin. Uh, in PESA, we honor our contracts with our investors because we actually sign our registration agreements with them. Registration agreements that are signed by both the head of the PESA as well as the investors. And therefore, uh, whether we have a change in the administration, the government is bound to honor and respect these contracts, realizing that these are all vested rights. And therefore, we can guarantee our locators that as long as they register with PESA, they can continue to operate, enjoy their incentives, and be viable with their operations in the Philippines. Uh, I think our International Affairs Committee Chairman, Mr. Jude Aguilar, will add. Yes, uh, well, in addition to that, we also have the National Center for Mediation, uh, which is organized by the PCI and recognized also by the Department of Justice. And we have other, uh, other legal entities or organizations uh, that can address that, uh, the, particularly the, the questions on uh, disputes. Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, on agriculture. So what are the opportunities in developing the halal industry in the Philippines? There is a big potential for the halal industry. Uh, there is a big market 
especially in the United Arab Emirates in the Middle East, and they are looking for halal products from the Philippines. The, the secret to this is uh, making it more access, the certification approach for halal products, make it more receptive and more uh, accessible to our producers of specific halal products. I think government through DTI and DA are strengthening their mechanisms with private sector involved in the certification of halal products. It's a very important uh, certification. It's a very important tool in penetrating a big market for halal products. The last question is for architect uh, June Palafox. And the question is, what are your experiences or insights working with the local governments in the Philippines? We have uh, many young mayors and governors right now, and they are more progressive thinking. Uh, they are uh, high tech, uh, very, very well traveled, very well educated. So I see a lot of uh, potentials. And, and uh, with the uh, urban planning uh, designs for our, uh, provinces, uh, cities, towns, islands and regions. And uh, as mentioned a while ago, I've done projects in 40 countries. Now I'm more focused in our country. And I really see a lot of development potential, especially for the next five years and up to 2050. I see the very high development potential. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice President June Palafox. And to close today's session, we will now call on Mr. Jude Aguilar, our Chairman for International Affairs and the Co-Chair of the 49th Philippine Business Conference and Expo for his closing remarks. We would like to express our appreciation to the Confederation of Asia Pacific Chambers of Commerce and Industry, or CASI, for the opportunity to showcase our country, the Philippines, as an investment and tourist destination. We are also grateful to our eight speakers who highlighted the various industries and business climate, to our PCI officers and members, and our over 180 attendees who contributed to making this a successful webinar. We look forward to future collaborations with CASI and PCCI. To everyone, Marami Salamat, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jude Aguilar. We do look forward to seeing all of you, either as investors coming to the Philippines or as tourists. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.